My microphone works good. Must be the suit. <laughs> I was thinking about New Jersey and preaching down at the... <laughs> I enjoyed my trip to New Jersey with Marty. Mar Marty walked us. Marty walked us into some alleys that we probably shouldn't have been in without him, <laughs> a native. He doesn't want that. Give me one slide, Chad. Look nice. <laughs> Let's bow our heads in prayer, shall we? God, you have been kind. You have been gracious. You have been loving to us, and I pray that our response is the same towards those around us. That what you have lavished upon us, we would be ever so willing to lavish on others around us whether it be what we learn here as we study your word or whether it be what we learn in your divine presence as we go to you in prayer or whatever it is that you are trying to speak into our lives and demonstrate to us, may we be ever willing to be an open vessel of your honor and grace and mercy towards others. And I pray, Father, that profound effect would be a reality in this northeast region where you have placed us where we work together for your glory and for your honor. I pray for divine appointments to share the things that we learn in your divine presence and that your boldness by your Holy Spirit would be upon us to move forward in your divine will and plan. And we ask this accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 12. <clears throat> We're going to bounce off of each other, hopefully, this morning. And I want to say, before we really get into this this morning, if you have some questions about things that are going on in the world, pieces of news that you have seen, uh, pieces of scripture that you have wondered about, this would be the atmosphere to ask about those things. Um, I feel like John and I are on the same page this morning. Sometimes we get into this and we study and we study and we study, but sometimes there's no outlet because no one's asking that question. Or sometimes there's no outlet for information that we have because it's not the particular subject that we're on. And a lot of times people will come to me with questions throughout the week. And it, it may not be what I preached on on Sunday morning or in Sunday school or Sunday night. But it was something that I knew about because God poured it out to me. And I didn't know why he gave it to me. But there's just things that John and I are privy to in our study and, and revelation of, of time with the Holy Spirit that never gets addressed. And, and maybe you feel that way sometimes. It's like, man, that was a good teaching, but I still have this question over here that's never really been answered. And if you have some, something like that, and at least try to keep it on topic. I mean, don't go to Esther and ask why she wore a purple dress. I mean, I mean try to keep it on <clears throat> on topic with prophecy and, and modern day events that are unfolding before us or perhaps like um, Don brought up last week well God showed me something he showed me a vision and this is what I saw that is that's, that's what I'm talking about um, examples of how God is working in your life so if you have something like that as we're going through this morning by all means bring that up alright Daniel chapter 12 the reason why we're bringing up Daniel chapter 12 is uh, we said last week when in Bible prophecy there, there's prophecy that has already been fulfilled within the pages of scripture and there is prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. And that's a, a distinct difference. We are honing this class to be a class about the prophetic that has not yet been fulfilled. Daniel chapter 12. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. What nation is he referring to? Israel. Israel. A lot of people just automatically, ah, that's America. Now this is, this is an Israeli prophet speaking to Israelis and God is speaking to him about their nation. 
even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this river bank and the other on that, that river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Isn't that a great question? In other words, when is this going to happen? And listen for the answer. Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a times, times, and a half time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So we got a time frame within a time frame. Daniel, you're going to be dead and gone by the time all this stuff happens. This isn't going to be a time that is coming far after you. It concerns the times of the end. Then he says this, Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who walks and comes to the 1,335 days, but you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of days. Daniel is told a piece of prophecy that is filled with things that concern the time of the end. And at his time, the book of Revelation was not written. Jesus had not come to the earth and told all the things that he said about the end of the age. And so this man has a piece of prophecy and he's saying, I don't get it. I don't understand. What is this times, times, and a half a time? I God, I don't get it. And he says, son, don't worry about it. This is not of any of your concern. I'm just put, telling you to put this down because this will come to pass in the future and people in that future date will have more information and they will be able to discern the times that they're living in and they will know exactly what is happening. And I want to say that there's a piece here about the uh, abomination that causes desolation setting itself up in the temple. This is a piece of prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. There is a future leader that will rise in the nation of Israel and project himself to be the leader, the Messiah of that nation. And then at a point, three and a half years into that administration, if you will, he will turn on Israel and it will all begin to disintegrate and it will all fall apart and, and the wicked times of the world will increase and increase and increase for three and a half years and then the whole thing is over. Jesus will return and set up his earthly kingdom. And so there are some pieces of prophecy right here in the Old Testament book of Daniel that have future reference of things that are yet to come. Now, here we are sitting in 2011. 12. Sheesh. It is a new year, isn't it? 2012. And the question is, because of uh, famous prophetic, worldly prophetic voices like Nostradamus, what did he say about 2012? Do you know? He says it's the end of the world. He prophesied this. I, I don't know. What, what year was Nostradamus? The, the, the Mayan calendar predicts the same thing. There's this sense that 2012 is the year. There, there's mathematic equations that scholars are using and, and guess what? It arrives in 2012 and there, there's all of these reasons why people are getting a little bit nervous 
And they're saying, is 2012 the end? And I, I have always said, well, we're not really looking for dates on a calendar. We're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I can understand if you're outside the faith, you're going to say to yourself, I'm nervous. Uh, the, the time of the end, what are we going to do? I, I better start saving up water. I better start saving up food. I better find uh, alternative energy sources. I, I better, I better, I better protect myself. Had a conversation just this week with a young man. He was planning on storing up the, the things we've talked about. Water, food, um, alternative energy sources, and ammunition. Right? Those are the, the four biggies. I, and I said the same thing to him that I said to all of you. How many dead bodies in your front yard till someone figures out that you have something of deep value inside of your house? How many people are you going to shoot? How many, uh, how many bodies do you bury under your house like that, that one clown murderer did? You know what I mean? How many before <coughs> your conscience is just seared? Or you could learn about Scripture and you can learn that there's a coming Messiah. There, there's a reason to live in this very hour and our reason to live in this very hour is to be a prophetic voice. To say, do you see all of these signs? We're not looking for dates. We're looking for signs of prophetic fulfillment and things that have not yet been fulfilled to put us in a time and season where we're looking for what the Lord is going to do next based upon his prophetic calendar, if you will. Does that make sense to everybody? I'd like to just digress for a second and take a look at Scripture because Daniel, in the words of Daniel here in the writings, we see the term age. Seal these things up until the end of the age. And Scripture talks about not only age, but ages, and mm -hmm. ages to come. So my reading of that, that tells me that there's a specific time that we're in, which had a beginning, is going to have an end. So if Daniel's told to seal these things up until the time of the end, there has to be benchmarks or there has to be road signs along the way to tell us what the time of the end is and that we're approaching the time of the end. So this age that we're presently living in, we don't know anything about the future ages. All we know is we can't imagine it. Scripture tells us we can't, mm -hmm. we can't right. think or imagine what God has planned for those who love him. So if the end of the age is what? What does the end of the age look like, just generally? What? Go ahead. Destruction. Destruction, that's part of the end of the age. Temple, the rebuilding of the temple. Rebuilding of the temple. We see the, we, actually, we see it in the book of Revelation. At the end of the age is when the heavenly Jerusalem comes down to earth. And God dwells here with us. But what was the beginning of this age? What started this age off? Christ's death. The rapture. We're going to discover this together. This complete age that we're living in right now, as Scripture's talking about, you'll know the end of the age, but what started this age? The resurrection of Christ. It even goes before that. This age, exactly. Adam and Eve started this age. This is a book about a family that started with a man named Adam and Eve. <laughs> Jesus is spoken throughout this book. And Jesus is coming back. And eventually the end of the age is going to happen. And then we pass on to other ages. We don't know what that looked like. Which makes me question, was there an age previous to this one? We don't know. And is there an age within that age? Because we're in the age of grace, because it's totally different for us than, than it, it was, was for Israel. Those, hmm? Than it was for Israel in the law. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we are to walk knowing that the clock is ticking. The end of the age is coming because it's been prophesied. 
that's why we're supposed to know the seasons. And that's why we become, when we know these things, a prophetic voice in a dark world saying, let me tell you why this is happening. We are approaching the end of the age. Not with fear or anxiety, but with clarity and understanding, we say with confidence, God already told us about that. He told us what the end of the age would look like, and that's why we have this class to hone and sharpen our skills so we know what this Bible says about the end of the age. Marty. I'm not sure if you brought this up uh, in, in, in a recent sermon or I heard it from a, a, a pastor on TV, but I remember hearing that that after Adam and Eve was cast from the garden, there was, wasn't any more mention of Adam and Eve to even say that they maintained their faith after that. Uh, well, I know for one I didn't say that, but um, you're right. I mean, once, once Adam and Eve have their kids, the story moves on to their kids. And once they have kids, the story moves on to their kids. And then once they have kids, the, the story just keeps moving on. And the whole point is to show us how the age unfolds. Be fruitful and multiply was the command. Obviously, they were pretty successful. <laughs> Here we are, the human race, uh, approaching how many billion? I think it's, are we at 8 billion? Is that correct? 7. 7 billion people on the planet. Did a pretty good job of being fruitful and, and multiplying. So that was, I mean, they had some pretty simple commands. But you're right, the story leaves Adam and Eve, and they're really not brought up until Romans chapter 6, 5 and 6. <clears throat> I mean, we don't hear much about Adam at all until Paul brings him back into the, into the story and says, you know when this all started, don't you? And he's saying the same thing as John. You know when this whole thing started, don't you? <clears throat> it started back with Adam and Eve, and it's been unfolding, and then it's going to end. This whole age is going to end, and it started with one prophetic word that God gave over the serpent. The serpent will strike against your, exactly. the, the heel... But the, the the one that he strikes against will crush his head. That's exactly right. That what is going. the prophetic utterance of the age. That this whole thing got messed up because of sin, but I will send my son who will crush the head of the enemy. You had a question, Linda? Yeah, are we to understand or is there significance in uh, verses I think it's eight where he says, Who lives forever? that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. Yes, yes. We are, we are supposed to understand that, but what I was trying to point out is Daniel had no reference for this, and he says so. I don't get it. To which the prophetic voice, the, the angelic voice says to him, don't worry about it. This does not concern <clears throat> you, Daniel. Just write it down. It will make sense to someone in the future. Then we have Jesus speaking about the end of the age. It starts to get a little bit, a little bit clearer. He refers back to Daniel in, in Matthew chapter 24. He refers to this portion of scripture. And then we have John the revelator. He gives us huge clues of what was going on. So for us it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer as scripture unfolds. And as Lillian just, just spoke out, it's a three and a half year period that, that he was referencing. A prophetic voice was reference, referencing to Daniel a three and a half period of wrath and tumult like the nation of Israel has never seen before. And, and really, they had not seen much tumult up until this point, except they had become prisoners of war. They were carted off. And the, the, their, their country was devastated to a certain degree. But, uh, okay, so that translates into the three and a half. Years. Exactly. Yeah, time, time, and a half time. But to Is go it, back to, to, to Marty's point, you're right, Marty, because we don't see Adam and Eve, the story of Adam and Eve anymore, from the fall in, Ma in uh, Genesis 3 15, where it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Um, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. They're actually speaking, speaking there of Jesus Christ coming. So what we see now is the seed following through scripture all the way to Christ. 
we see a battle, again, from Satan trying to battle and trying to kill off that line, that seed that's running through man right to Jesus Christ. And it really makes sense because the prophetic word came to Satan. Eventually you will be destroyed and it will come through the seed of the woman. So he's tracking the human race. If I could just destroy, if I can just destroy the human race, if I can just destroy the human race, and Satan's agenda is to stop this prophetic word. I don't want to be destroyed, so if I can destroy babies being born, if I can destroy the, the Messiah coming, I can, I can thwart history. And so what, did, what happened when Herod was king? What did he do? Babies. Kill he babies. killed babies. Why? Stopping the seed. To stop Jesus, to stop the seed from delivering the fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus comes about and all of a sudden we are born of him. We are co-heirs and we are children of God. So what does Satan do? He immediately tries to attack us because we are in God's image. We are created in his image. He lost that. Uh, let's go to a piece in First Chronicles chapter 12. It's not a prophetic piece, but it, it's an important piece to us as a body of believers that, that is studying the Word of God to, to figure out where we are in history and what's unfolding around us and to be able to talk about news pieces that you see, particularly as it relates to the nation of Israel. I mean, you, you think, why, why this tiny nation is the centerpiece of news pieces all the time? political speeches right here in this, this country. Why do we talk about this tiny nation? Why does it still get significant press all the time? Because it is the centerpiece. It, it, it is the centerpiece of all that is happening. And we must understand what's going on in the nation of Israel. But First Chronicles 12, look at verse 32. It says, Of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And I just want to stop and say that to me has always jumped off the page. That there were some men from the tribe of Issachar that understood the times and knew what Israel, the nation that they lived in, what they ought to do. And, and I want to say that that might not do something for you, but let me explain a little. Maybe it will do something for you this morning. That perhaps we could be a people that understand the times and know what people ought to do around us. Instead of storing up for yourselves treasures down here on earth to preserve your life, perhaps we can lead people to Jesus Christ and point to Him as the author and the finisher of the faith that the world is in fact unwinding and it is unwinding at an unprecedented rate. It increases and increases at a rapid pace the unwinding process of this world. And we, sh we should be able to say to people, we're right on target. I mean, when people come to you all stressed out and you say back to them, we're right on schedule. And you smile at them. <laughs> and you'd be like, what? <clears throat> what do you know that I don't know? That, that, that will be the conversation. What do you know that I don't know? I said, well, I know the whole story. Do you have time? Would you like to sit down and know how this whole thing, this whole age unravels? And you will have a long lunch, I guarantee you. Sit down with someone, tell them about the age. Tell them from Genesis to Revelation. Tell them how it's all supposed to unravel and how they're to look for a king. You will be like the men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what needed to be done. And that's the reason we're gathering here this morning. But, but John said something of, of significance that we're dealing with an age here. And why, why is it rapidly increasing? I, I want to take you on a, a calendar that the nation of Israel walked through. Starting in 63 BC. And I say, uh, we're just going to start with this and it might seem like an arbitrary date, but it's not an arbitrary date. At 63 BC, the Romans conquered uh, Israel along with all of the other empire region around them. And it stems back to some prophecies that Daniel had. You remember the, the image that had the gold head and, and, and the different features of, of 
silver and brass and, and then iron. And we recognize that the Roman Empire was part of, of that. Does anyone remember where the Roman Empire came in? In that vision. Lillian Searchin. I... <clears throat> I mean, in the vision. Daniel saw this vision and he explained it to Nebuchadnezzar. He says, the head of gold, that's you. That's the Babylonian Empire. There, there's no empire that matches it, King Nebuchadnezzar. You are that head of gold. But what will come after you is an empire of lesser value. And then what will follow is an empire of lesser value. And then what will come after you is an empire that will become divided and it's of lesser value. And then it was just right down through the... The vision. The the, right. Yeah. Right. So it would become of less and less significance. Nevertheless, in 60 B3, 63 BC, the Roman Empire would have rule over the nation of Israel as, as well as much of, of the Middle East. And we say this to understand that something was happening. There was a transference of power because Israel was supposed to be a sovereign nation under the rule and authority of Almighty God, correct? But they turned on God and the Assyrians came in and invaded them from the north, but they never really took over. But the Babylonian Empire, however, under King Nebuchadnezzar, he spread his rule. He spread his authority. And we recognize that under this, it would transfer from empire to empire and eventually empires would cease to be and certain countries would have rule over the nation of Israel. And I want to walk through time with you up until 1948. We want to, we want to walk through time together if we could this morning. It, wasn't it the Assyrians that came in and took over the northern kingdom? Right. The ten tribes? Right. And they were taken and they were considered to be the lost tribes of Israel. They were literally scattered. You don't see them physically in any location. You see them throughout different regions. You see them throughout Europe, throughout Russia, um, eventually America. We see a lot of the, the Jews migrating here. But they were considered the lost tribes. Right. But the tribes of Judah... Jerusalem being its headquarters were actually <coughs> overtaken by the Babylonians. Right. The, Nebuchadnezzar and his rule came in and invaded and they took over and established themselves an empire. And none, none, was, none was like King Nebuchadnezzar. Brilliant man. Uh, was able to conquer much. But uh, that, that Roman Empire would last from 63 BC all the way until the year 313. That's a long time for the Roman Empire to rule. Much of, the, the, much of our culture has been impacted by the Roman culture. I don't know if you understand that, but you walk around much of the cities here in America, much of the architecture has been influenced by Roman culture. Mm -hmm. and, and you say, why is that? Because when people came across the ocean to establish a nation over here, it was influenced much by Rome. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church. How many of you have ever heard of the Roman Catholic Church? Uh, our, our country has been impacted by the Roman Catholic Church because that's, that's the empire that it came from. It, it's not some fishy, weird story. It's how America became part of the story. It's this nation was just kind of a, a vast woodlands that the, the Indians roamed on and just enjoyed the land. And there were some people that came over and established colonies here and they brought a certain culture with them and it became a melting pot because uh, also the Russian culture brought over the Russian Orthodox Church and the Italian community brought with them the, the Roman Catholic Church and I mean... The, the Irish culture brought with them their, their religion and what happened in this country. I mean, we just had a, a mess and a sea of communities that spoke one language. This community spoke their language. This community spoke their language and they all had their church and their culture, right? But then 
the Irish people intermarried with the Italians and then all of a sudden where do we go to church and then there's fighting and then they just start new churches. You, you understand how the history of this thing unfolds. So we do have ties to what happened in history, how, how dominion and authority down here on earth actually impacts us on a level that we don't even understand why. Uh, pagan rituals are a part of our holidays. Why? Because of the Roman dominion that ruled over in Europe and that part of the world. It, it was just part of what was going on. And we have inherited much of these things and we don't even understand why things are the way they are. But is it beginning to become clearer? Look at our lights. Are those Roman? You sure scream it to me. <laughs> <laughs> The numbers, the calendar, everything. Right. And, of course, in, in our area, we're still rich with a lot of heritage, right? Because on the news yesterday, they're telling us all, it was Christmas. Like, I, I thought Christmas was a couple weeks ago. Well, that's another calendar. That's the Julian calendar. And still have a lot of influence <clears throat> on these cultures today because of empires that were very powerful. And it makes me wonder about these Arab countries rising up against uh, Europe and against the United States, if that isn't a, uh, you know, uh, an ongoing thing from the Babylonian Empire. Oh, Marty, you nailed it on the head. All of this is is a, is a thrust for who's going to be in charge. Exactly. Empires rise and fall, and when, when an empire falls, they go behind closed doors and say, how can we take over the world again? I mean, that's not like a cartoon thing, ah, oh, we're going to take over the world. I mean, people really do this stuff. They sit behind closed doors and wonder if they can get their hands on atomic weapons. They wonder if they can use them. I mean, that's why we have this nation, Iran. They're trying to flex their muscles and say, if we can just get our hands on some nuclear weapons, we can, we can puff our chest out and say, we're someone to, to reckon with. Except they have behind their whole system, not just for earthly power, they believe they're ushering in a, a Muslim messiah. So they, they've got religious overtones that they will be willing to kill you because the Quran says to kill the infidel. So we've got all of this going on around us all the time. But the Roman Empire ended in 313 AD and then the Byzantine Empire took over. And the Byzantine Empire ruled from 313 to 636 B.C. And um, I think that's where the Russian uh, architecture took on, you know, the whole A.D. A.D. We went from, we transferred from 63 B.C. We went across the timeline. Remember, uh, when Jesus was born in Israel, they didn't have a king. That's why Herod was threatened. We heard that a king has been born. He is Christ the Lord. That was under a Roman authority. And Herod said, there's no king but me. <laughs> and that's why he wanted to extinguish any possibility of Israel having their own king. So that, that went across the timeline there all the way into 3, 313. Byzantine Empire, 313 to 636. And then uh, the Arabs that you just mentioned. The Arabs ruled over Israel from 639 to 1099. It's a long time. The Arabs actually had a rule. And if you'll remember, who, who owns the Temple Mount at this point in history? The Arabs. The Arabs. They actually have a temple. Uh, the, the gold dome is a Muslim house of worship. And it sits on the very spot of Solomon's temple that was built for worship to the Most High. Think of that. The Arabs came in and just established, no, this is going to be a Muslim headquarters. This is going to be the place where these things happen. And then how many of you remember the time of the Crusaders? The Crusaders would follow and the Arabs and the Crusaders, which were actually of Latin descent, they would go at it and try to establish. And uh, I was joking around this morning. Uh, their slogan was, God wills it. <laughs> They would kill in the name of Jesus. They, they would put people in, in, in great rooms and tell them that they were going to have this wonderful service together and then they would burn the building down with people in it and they would do it all in the name of the Lord and say, God wills it. 
and think, wow, that's what the Crusaders were all about. And, you know, I, I always kind of think it's strange that there are Christian colleges whose mascot is a Crusader. <laughs> I think, gosh, that was an awful blemish on our history. Why in the world would you ever choose the Crusader? Those, those are the dark ages, correct? Yeah, truly. Because we think that the Crusaders were fighting for the things of Christ. They're right, but they were, they were literally killing murdering in the name of Christ and it, it was a it was an ugly ugly blotch on history uh, that would go to 1291 1099 to 1291 and then the Mamluk rule I don't even know who these characters are that's just that's just a loose canon in my brain the Mamluks but they ruled from 1291 to 1516 does anyone have do you remember your history do you remember who the Mamluks are anyway for a long time, we're going from 63 BC, and before that, there were other, the Medio uh, Persian rule was over Israel, uh, the Babylonian system was over Israel. So this, this actually goes back in time to like to 720 BC. That this, this goes all the way back in time where Israel no longer had sovereign rule over themselves. This, this is a long <coughs> timeline through history. When the Jews obeyed God and went to battle, and God would tell them to kill everyone, the women, the children. Sure. And when you were talking about the Crusaders and stuff, I thought, wow, God himself said that. that that's true. I, I, don't, I, I don't have inner circle knowledge of what God was telling the Crusaders. And if he was telling them to do that. And that's what I was wondering. Yeah. But we don't have a prophetic utterance from God telling the Crusaders. I mean, at least not written in this book. All we have, now let me let, let you understand the, the history here. Ezekiel 36 that we went over last week, all we had was a prophecy that said for 1,800 years that it would be a desolate nation. And then, after a certain time period, they would become like a Garden of Eden again. People would start to come from all over the world back to Israel. And last week we said, this is prophetic utterance being fulfilled in our day from Ezekiel chapter 36. And we said, that's, that's fascinating. It's phenomenal that these powers would rise and these are just <coughs> dots along the road that say, well, here's how this all got filled in. For all of these years, they didn't have rule or authority over themselves because these empires and these nations and peoples ruled over Israel. That's why it is the way that it is. Then uh, the Ottomans. Does anyone, anyone familiar with the Ottoman? The Ottoman Empire or the Ottoman rule went from 1517 to 1917. And all of a sudden we're ushering ourselves into modern history. And we're thinking, all right, 1917, that, that really, that's like less than 100 years ago that Israel was ruled by the Ottoman Empire. <clears throat> And then, after the Ottoman Empire was, was finished in 1917, the British ruled over Israel from 1918 to guess what year? 1948. 1948. And then something happened in 1948. What was it? Israel became a nation again. And you think, wow. Now... Here comes a timepiece, 1948. Uh, Ezekiel said, Isaiah said, I mean, multiple prophets said, you're going to be nothing. You're going to be a desert wasteland for a long time. But there's coming a time in the future where you will be a nation again. And you think to yourself, that's pretty amazing. Here it is on, on the calendar of time, 1948, <coughs> something significant happened. And all of the news cameras were on this nation watching them become a nation again when they had not been a nation since the invasion of the Assyrians by Sargon in 722 BC. That's the last time they had a king. Isn't that fascinating? I, I saw a wonderful story on a Christian uh, TV station about, about Israel and about uh, when they talk about the land of milk and honey that... Israel now produces more milk. Yeah, we were watching that here. Oh, yeah, remember? That's where I saw it. Yeah, you saw it. You saw that here, baby. That's when I was watching TV. 
<laughs> you may have seen it on television. It was CNN or Christian CBN. That was CBN. Christian Broadcasting Network. That was on CBN. So you may have you may have seen it on television. But go to Ezekiel chapter 37. We were in Ezekiel 36 last week. In Ezekiel chapter 37 will tell us this prophecy that they would be a desert wasteland. And in this prophecy, they would be dry bones. They would be a dead nation. And Ezekiel is getting this prophecy long before any of this happens. Are we all right? We had nothing to say. It's almost an hour later. <laughs> <laughs> How does that happen? <laughs> Do you have anything to say? I, I, it's, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that God, when dealing with his people, brought them in to their land. God delineated it. He said, this is your land. If. It was conditional. Mm -hmm. They rebelled against God. And just to bring it to my household, it's like saying, get out. How many times do I have to tell you, get out? This is no longer your land. They were exiled out. When they left, when they were taken over, when they left, the blessing of God on that land left with them. That's right. So for over 1,800 years, this whole land that was given to God's people that was to be blessed really was back under the curse. Nothing grew there. Became a wasteland. Became a desert. People would take over. The, different empires would come in. They would. It, there was nothing to do with this land. It was just barren. Couldn't grow anything there. There was no water. Mm -hmm. They left. But God said, one day, I'm going to bring you back from all corners of the earth into your own land and restore that covenant with them. And that's what we're about to see. But that was for 2,534 years. And the actual day, I don't want to get ahead, but the actual day that they became a nation again actually lines up with the feast of the Jews. And, and once you get into there, you're in, sometimes you feel like you're in deep water and you're in over your head. But you can do this. What he's talking about, the feast days of Israel, all of it has significance. All of it has meaning and purpose. They were not just festivals that they did every year. Things unfold on certain feast days into the future. And actually the, the, the Jewish calendar is of utmost significance. And if you recognize the Israeli calendar, it is only a 360 day calendar, while we here in the States are under a different calendar, 365 days, and it throws all kinds of monkey wrenches when you're trying to study and put things on certain dates because it doesn't fit on our calendar. It's only going to make sense when you go back to a Jewish calendar and recognize that they do certain things on their calendar that make sense throughout their history. They are unchanged. We are the ones that change around them because of our our Roman influence and all of the, the empires that influence us as a culture. Does that make sense? Yeah. And sometimes we see things and we're like, well, that doesn't make sense on our calendar because you, know, you ever wonder why Passover is different on your calendar every year? It's not on the same day. And because it's a Jewish holiday. It's a Jewish feast. And their calendar is a 360-day calendar. So the times, time, and a half a time thing, that has to be viewed through the scope of a 360 day year calendar. Otherwise, the dates don't make sense. 1335 days, 1290 days. These don't make sense in terms of years because we try to interpret them through this lens of 365 days. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it counts. But, but let, let, let me tell you about Ezekiel. I have a little <clears throat> note that I'd like to read to you about him. Ezekiel was a priest taken to Babylon in 597 B.C. Before 586, he preached a message of judgment and doom. After 586, he focused on hope and salvation. The source of his hope is not in any of the political powers of his day, but in God's own nature and purpose. 
The temple is destroyed, but God is not bound by a temple and was, has moved into exile with his people. The sins of the past will not keep the present generation from choosing life and salvation. The book ends with a great vision of the future restoration of the people and the temple of the Israeli people. So that's Ezekiel's story. He starts his prophecies with, if you don't repent, God's going to judge us. They didn't repent. They all go into Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel goes with them. But he doesn't stop getting revelation. Even while he's in, in bondage with the rest of them, he's still getting prophetic utterances from the Lord revealing their future and how he's going to restore everything. So Ezekiel is a phenomenal piece of, uh, of prophecy that, that much of where we are in our day has to do with Ezekiel 36, 37, and 38. You'll hear lots of people talking about Ezekiel 36, 37, and 38 because it's right where we are. Because of 1948 and all that is happening, we're watching things unfold at an unprecedented rate and we're saying 1948 had real significance because now they're a nation again. And all of the fulfillment of Scripture can start to take root because they are a nation again. The, so, uh, I'm sorry. One more thing before John speaks. When, when you hear our president or our administration start to encroach upon Israel and say that they need to give up land for peace, that should put up flags in your spirit to say, oh, no, 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 the prophecies say, the prophecy says this, don't, don't, don't we even dare try to infringe upon that because judgment will actually come upon us as a people, not on them. These prophecies will not be thwarted. So if we try to force them to change the prophecies and what has been spoken over this nation, we will bring wrath upon ourselves. And that, that's literally what happens when we speak against that nation. I'm sorry. I, I wanted to say God has never abandoned his people. His original covenant still stands. But they became stiff-necked. They rejected God's word. And he set them aside. You'll see that in Romans. Just kind of fast-forwarding here. So he entered in, ushered in the age of what? Grace. Age of grace, correct? That's us. That's the church age. Jesus speaks about that in, in uh, the book of Revelation. The church age. It's the age of grace. But that prophetic time clock stopped and was reintroduced. In other words, it started ticking again in 1948. That's when God said, I'm bringing my people back to their land I told you there would be a nation that would come back within one day. It's here. And now you can watch the time clock of prophecy starting to click off very quickly. And, and, and the reason John says that there was a time out is because Daniel gives so many specific days that correspond with years. And they don't correspond unless you incorporate what happened in 1948. And then all of a sudden the prophecies turned back on again. Daniel's time out stopped in 1948. Yes. Okay, so so in uh, in 1948, then then where was the statue that we were talking about, Daniel? Where were we at the bottom? I, the I, yeah, I think we're I think we're the, the next thing that has to happen is these ten nations, the ten toes. Yeah, the, ten the ten nations come together, and that's the last part that has to to happen. Isn't that the European Union? Well, some people have speculated that that it could be the European it's Union, nation, except for. I think the Confederacy of the European Union is actually beginning to go beyond ten nations. So people are becoming <clears throat> speculating, maybe there's another ten nation coalition, or maybe the European Union is going to divide into some ten nation again, because there's already too many nations involved in the European Union. So it, it's tough. We're always wanting to prophesy and say, oh, here it is, here it is. Right. But at least it's forming. There's these confederations that are forming and, and we get all we who read the Bible we get all excited and say, Ooh, ten toes. Ten toes. Because the next thing that happens in the vision is that a rock is formed out of heaven and destroys the whole statue, destroys all man's empires, and then that becomes a mountain in itself and it and, and starts to give you pictures of what the end time will look like where Christ himself establishes his rule on planet Earth. You say, wow. Can, can you, just because I didn't quite get it, can you 
restate what you said about when our nation, our administration starts to talk against Israel, beware of what? Beware of judgment coming upon this nation. Okay. Because when we try to step in and say, well, you, you've got to come to peace. You've got to give the Palestinians this land. No, this is promised land. This is promised land to Israel. And these prophetic words will not be thwarted. So in 1948, when they became a nation, we should have just said, let them be. We're, we're watching something supernatural unfold before our eyes. 1967, uh, Six-Day War. So, there was no way. No way these people win this war. Supernatural intervention, they win the war, right? So we should just step back and say, let God be God. That's why, that's why there's so many people who say, we need a godly president that understands these words. Otherwise, we, we meddle in matters that will actually begin to destroy us if we're not careful. Does that make sense? Yeah, but we know that, you know, that Israel is going to be destroyed. You know, that that's going to be the battleground and all that stuff anyways. Right. But, and, and you're right, perhaps we play a part in that. And I can't underestimate that. But someone that, that reads Bible prophecy says that to know what happens to nation that interfere with Israel, <laughs> back up. I mean, if I were in the cabinet of the president, I'd say, back off, man. Don't say nothing about them. Just let them be a sovereign nation. Let the, let the word of God be pure. You know? And isn't Israel the, the land itself a lot smaller than the land that was actually given by God? They never yeah, you're right. They they have not ever occupied all of it. You're right. There there's a certain <coughs> boundaries that are set back in the book of Joshua that Joshua just kinda dies off and they never really really take it all. You're right. And it it would go into Iraq and it, it's the boundaries are pretty large. So they are less of a nation than what they actually deserve from, from God's gifting. Lily. Well, on TV and be more, all the pastors are talking about Israel and they're going back with the prayer shawl and all these things. They were not for us. They were for no. these. So why are we... I, I don't know, except the, an identity crisis perhaps. Uh, we're Gentiles. Acts 15 uh, screams out to me. There were not any restrictions really put on the Gentiles except to keep their focus on Jesus Christ. To not interact with the pagan culture, but to pursue this relationship with the Lord. In this hour of grace, that's the only way the, 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 the disciples in Acts could explain it. They actually had a, a, a church council meeting. What do we do with all these Gentiles that are getting saved? Do we make them correspond with the law? What do we do? And you say, no, they're, they're not Jewish. Why should they be doing things that are in the law if they're not Jewish? Because God himself, Paul would write, would write the laws upon their heart and they would carry out things that he is leading them to do. So, but you're right. There's not, there's not a necessary prayer shawl. We actually can go into the presence of the Lord ourselves because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so we're supposed to understand the festival of the weeks, all those different, you know, things, but we're not just we don't, we're not <coughs> And, and we may at some point, and that's not to say that in the future that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ might lead us through festivals one day. Exactly. But he'll give us instructions on how, but, but we're, we're not Jewish. I'm not Jewish anyway. I don't know how many people are Jewish in this room, but I don't celebrate the feast. I, I celebrate Christ. And Paul says, I preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, period. I don't preach the law. And, you know, he came against Peter, if you remember in Galatians. He says, you act like a Jew when you're around Jews. You act like a Gentile. You're a hypocrite. And he, like, slammed him in front of everybody. He didn't even take him to the back room. He just publicly just hammered him. you, you got to say, wow, there's something going on there of great significance. Look, we're not going to get to Ezekiel 37. We're going to have to open up with that. We're already uh, at 1035. So what we'll do, we'll stop here. We'll open up with Ezekiel 37. I believe it will be an amazing prophecy. It will open your eyes to the time period that we're living in now. Because I, I, I know that's where we're at. We're in the middle of Ezekiel 37. Unfolding. And there's yet prophecy to be fulfilled. And we can, we can spend a lot of time in Ezekiel 37. So um, let's, let's just stop there. and then. I just have a question for you. We, we advertise that we're going to start at 930 
Is that something you guys actually want to do? Start at 9:30 because we kind of come in, and I I do that also around 9:25, 9:30, 9:35. We could do that. If if you want to do that, we'll start right on the button at 9:35 or 9:30. It could give us more time. Do you want to do that next week? There you go. I actually advertise Sunday school at 9:15 on the sign outside to get people to <laughs> <laughs> come in early. But All right. I know how we are. We we become people that are are more comfortable with ourselves, and we start when we're ready to start. But uh, but yeah, good. I'm idea. paramilitary. I'm sorry. I just, That's all right. Well, we'll let it slide. Till 9:30. <laughs> this is important stuff. It is. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for what you are showing us. I pray that our eyes are open, that our ears are open to respond to what it is that you are speaking to us in this time period. And I pray that we would not be aloof, that we would be clear on this and be able to speak with the authority of heaven on what it is that you put into our hands. And we ask this accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's take a short break and get back here.